What's up folks, 138MMA here. We're going to break down the entire UFC Vegas 75 card. I'm going to cover every single fight on this one. I'm going to break down every single matchup. I've got a lot of over-unders that I like on this card as well, so I will allude to some of those for you. Um, before we get into that, you can find me on Twitter, 138MMA, same thing on Tapology. And if you want access to all of my picks with confidence, my notes, um, some my Patreon parlay, all that good stuff, well, I just gave it away. It's on patreon.com slash 138MMA. You can find all of that there. There are different tiers for different levels of support. You know, maybe you just want to go over there and drop three bucks a month just to support the channel and not get anything out of it other than a, hey, thanks, I appreciate you. That's an option as well. But Go ahead and find me over there. Go ahead and find me on Twitter, all that good stuff. And let's break down UFC Vegas 75 before I waste any more time rambling. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all off the card we have Medeskis Bukowskis taking on Zach Pauga now this matchup is at light heavyweight so the four and one on the last five for Pauga his one loss is up at heavyweight he's now down at light heavyweight which is where he should be so he's now down at light heavyweight for Bukowskis three and two in the last five um, this is now his uh, second stint in the UFC had a bit of a rough spot you know leaving the UFC got got a few losses in a row got his knee smashed by uh by Khalil Roundtree but Went outside the UFC, got a couple of wins, brought back in to fight Tyson Pedro, and made good work of uh, Tyson Pedro. Beat him up pretty good. So in this one here, we've got a couple of guys who've looked different in the UFC than they have outside of the UFC. And we're going to kind of cover with the information we have, and some of it will make sense to you, and then some of it will be kind of confusing if you haven't seen anything outside the UFC. Like, for example, let's start with the uh, Bukowskis guy. Bukowskis side. That was hard to say. Uh, he's got good striking. The problem that he does have is, although he's got good footwork, he's willing to back up a lot. And I don't like that in most people because I don't, most fighters, I don't want them backing up because why? Well, you're usually losing, uh, losing in the eyes of the judges is bad optics. So backing up is not usually a good thing, but he does counter very well while he's doing so. So he's moving backwards. Not always, sometimes he's moving laterally, but he's moving backwards a lot of the time. Um, and then he'll go through his counters or whatever as you come in to pursue. Uh, the one thing I don't like is, well, probably the, the other thing I don't like, other than moving backward, after he throws his combinations, his hands drop, and they come down. And I don't know if you guys have noticed this. He was a little better about it in the Pedro fight. Still not great. He'll throw his combinations, and then instead of bringing his hands back here to defend, they come down here. And it's just a bad idea. Because Pauga, a former heavyweight, he hits pretty hard, so keep that in mind. Um... In addition to that, the grappling. So Bukowskis has pretty decent takedown defense, and I do think he wants to keep this on the feet. Uh, it's not lights out takedown defense, but it's pretty good. Uh, he also has decent grappling because he's hard to hold down, but when he does get on top of a guy, he's going to throw a, a very heavy volume of strikes, which is surprising because on the feet, he's not a big volume guy, but once he gets once he gets on top on the ground, he's going for that volume on the ground and pound. He's got cardio to last all three rounds as well, and that's going to be important because Zach Plauga is the only person that's been able to take Jordan Wright to a decision. So there's that. Uh, Zach Pauga, he's a decent striker. That's what we've seen from him in the UFC here. He's going to mix up his strikes very well, his punches, his kicks, elbows, whatever. He's going to mix those things up. And I do like that because a lot of guys are either boxing or they're kicking or whatever. He's going to mix things together. He's got decent counter shots as well. He's shown that a little bit. And the volume is actually pretty good for a guy that's kind of on the bigger side. He's now down at light heavyweight, but you know what I'm saying. Like he's a bigger guy. Uh, he does have a strong clinch. Now, not just the cage push, which I'm going to talk about here in a second, but just in open space, his clinch. He has some very good knees from there, but we haven't seen it a ton in the UFC. In, outside the UFC, pre-UFC, that clinch, he's got a lot of good knees from there that you'll see on his regional scene footage that if, if he starts to implement that, might see some success with it. Uh, when he does use his wrestling, if he gets on top of a guy, he's got some heavy, heavy ground and pound if he wants to use it. Um, but a lot of times, he as we saw in the uh, the uh, Jordan Wright fight, he's content to push guys up into the cage and get a lot of control time doing that, working the takedowns if need be, whatever. He is a bit of a slow starter, and that's kind of a problem uh, because, you know, this could be a really rough first round because Bukowskis, like I said, not the most volume on the feet. And if Pauk is going to be a slow starter, it's going to be a boring first round. Honestly, I think this one is the first fight where I'm going to mention that I like the over better than I like picking a side here. Um, I actually don't like picking a side at all. And I flipped my pick a couple of times, and uh, 
I actually just had to look at my notes to see who I ended up on last when I when I jotted it down. That that tells you how not confident am I, I am in the pick. But I do like the over. For the sake of a pick, I'm going to take Pauga. And the reason why is I think that when it comes to minute winning, if it goes to the decision, he's going to have a lot of time where he's pushing Bukowskis up against the cage. And I think if he's just got a lot of time pushing Bukowskis up against the cage, regardless of the striking numbers, because Pauga was outstruck in the Jordan Wright fight and still won the, the you know the decision... I think Pauga is going to get the nod. So I'm going to lean Pauga. Zero confidence in him. There's even there's a fight later on where I have even less confidence than that. But, uh, but yeah, Pauga's the pick. Let me know what you guys have. I would love to hear it. The over should be a good play, and I'll see Except you We've got a fight. Bantamweight matchup that essentially looks like a wrestling match with MMA gloves on. But we're going to find out. Who knows? A lot of times those grappler versus grappler fights end up being a slugfest. We have Dan Argetta and Ronnie Lawrence. Both guys 4-1 in their last five. Both guys solid wrestlers. But the difference is, for Dan Argetta, he's a guy that favors the control and pressure, and just once he gets you down, he doesn't want to let you back up. For Ronnie Lawrence, it's shoot a crap load of takedowns and keep doing that, and let, if you get back up, he's just going to take you right back down. A lot of mat returns, things like that. So for Ronnie Lawrence, it's the scrambling, the takedown volume, things like that. For Dan Argetta, it's the get on top, control, and then start working in the ground and pound once you get control. On the feet, both guys are just kind of decent, um, not... Not exceptional in any way. Uh, they both have a high pace, they, you know, cardio, high pace. I just wrote two different things because I didn't want it to look like a mirror. Uh, but yeah, both guys are very similar in what they do. It's just who's going to be able to do it better in this fight? Who's going to be able? To, who's going to be able to mix in their wrestling better? Who's going to be able to maybe do the striking better? I think that volume of strikes is going to slightly go to Ronnie Lawrence, but probably not by a lot. But I think a little bit. Um, I do think that the the more Oh, how do I say that? Who do I think that the more takedown attempts are obviously going to be from Ronnie Lawrence, but I think that the cleaner takedowns are going to end up coming from Argetta because Lawrence will shoot a takedown even if he doesn't think he's going to get it sometimes because he knows he can just chain another one. So I think that the the better shots are going to come from the Argetta side, and I think that the volume of takedowns is going to come from Ronnie Lawrence. This is a really hard one to pick. Uh, my confidence is very low in this one as well. Uh, there's a couple of there's some there's some fights coming up where I've got some real confident picks. This one is not one of them, but I do love the over. I love the over. So it's another one of the over unders I mentioned. So I'm gonna take Ronnie Lawrence, but uh, I wouldn't suggest betting him. I'd suggest betting the over. You can parlay that up. I think this fight goes to decision, and I think it's gonna be a really tough one. And I just could not for the life of me expect the judges to get it figured out correctly and honestly i wouldn't want to be a judge in this one because like i said it's going to be a tough just wrestling match with mma gloves from my guess or we end up getting a slugfest and who knows so let me know what you guys think do you think it's going to be a slugfest or do you think we're going to get a wrestling match with mma gloves i'm sorry if you hear the boat in the background but i'll see you in the next fight my weight matchup here we have gabriella fernandez taking on Teresa bleda both ladies 4-1 and one in their last five. Bleda is the taller, longer fighter at 5'9 with a 71-inch reach, as opposed to the 5'6", 67.5-inch reach for Fernandez. Now, this is an interesting matchup to me. So before I get into my, my, my hot takes here, I'm going to cover what they're good at, but I have a very confident lean in this fight. So just, you know, hear me out here. So let's, uh, let's start with Fernandez. Uh, she's a good striker. She's going to stay active in her striking. She's going to work her combinations, and she has decent power when she's doing so. Also, the best part about her game, I think, is her kicks, and her kicks to all levels. She can kick in the leg, the body, or even the face. She is pretty darn good at all of those things. The zip on the strikes, I love it. What I don't like is the poor takedown defense and the fact that she just stays down once she's taken down. For Blada, it's a similar thing where I have something I very much like and something I very much don't. She is solid wrestling. Good takedowns. Her control is very impressive. She has solid ground and pound. And if you haven't seen her fights pre-UFC, maybe you didn't get to see enough of that ground and pound, but it's pretty heavy once she gets it going. She's not as good off her back, so I'll, I'll, I will throw that out there. Uh, but she can also get work up against the cage, hold you up there while she's racking up control time, and then just work in the takedowns whenever she needs one. But the problem is her striking. It's really basic. It's just a one-two, and her hands just come right down. So it's one-two, and it falls down with the hands. Not always. Sometimes she'll bring them back, but a lot of times it'll it'll come back. It'll come down low. Well, the reason why is because a lot of times she just wants to get that takedown. That's it. So she's throwing the one-two, getting her hands low, so she can go in for the hips. The one-two is just to get you thinking up. So... Basic striking, not good here. Now, a lot of people have said she has good jujitsu. I haven't seen it yet. Um, not, not, not to the level that I would worry about anyway. 
here's the deal. I see, I've seen a lot of people on Twitter picking Gabrielle Fernandez and like, oh yeah, better this, better that. She's going to win inside the distance. You guys are nuts. Teresa Blade is winning this fight. She's going to make it look pretty easy. In fact, I've got her in a parlay. I've also bet her by KOTKO at plus 800. Why do I say that? Because I think she's going to ground and pound Fernandez's face in, and I think she's going to get it done. I think Teresa Blada makes this fight look easy. People were looking at Teresa Blada like, oh, yeah, but she looked really bad in her last fight. It was Natalia Silva, the girl that's just wrecking people now. She's the hottest prospect at, in the flyweight division outside of Aaron Blanchfield as far as the hype goes. So for Natalia Silva to be the fight that Teresa Blada lost and had her moments where she looked all right, I think Teresa Blada is going to just cut right through Gabriela Fernandez. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe she gets caught. I don't think so. I think Blade is getting this one done. I know she got knocked out by uh, by Natalia Silva. Natalia Silva is a absolute killer now. All of a sudden, like, took some time off, came back, killer. Teresa Blade had her moments there. I think she gets this one done. I'm pretty darn confident in it. Very confident, in fact. And not only that, but I think Teresa Blade is going to be the highest scorer on all the the Daily Fantasy stuff. I'm not the Daily Fantasy guy, so check with your other your other people for that. I just recently started playing like a month and a half ago. But based on what I've seen, fighters like this score a crap load of points. So, Teresa Blade is my pick. Let me know if you think I'm silly. I don't mind the, the debate, and I'd love to hear from you. So, it's I'll see you in the next fight. bout between Zhaogas Zumagulov taking on uh, Felipe Buniz, I think is how you say it. Uh, Buniz is 3-2 and two in his last five, 1-4 and four for Zhumagulov. Uh, now, for, for Buniz, he is five foot seven with a 71-inch reach, which is the taller, longer fighter. He's fighting the 5'4", 66 and a half inch reach for Jumagulov. Now, we've all seen it. Jumagulov has just had a rough run in decisions, okay? So for Jumagulov, his best best bet here is to try to get this fight done before the judges get a, a, get a say in the matter. Win or lose, I think either way, if it goes to decision, the guy's probably going to lose. So Jumagulov wants to get this one done. Now, how is he going to do it? Let's look at his skills. He's got decent striking. The volume is there, and he's got a good leg kick. The problem is his striking defense isn't that good. So even when he's looking pretty good here, he's also getting hit. So that's a problem. One of the reasons the judges kind of don't like him. He does have good wrestling. He's got good takedowns, good takedown volume, honestly. Even, even if he doesn't get the takedown, he's going to work you up against the cage and hold you there, get some control time. He's got good takedown defense as well, but that durability shows because he gets hit a lot. He makes every fight just a little bit too close, and that's the problem. Now, for Buniz, good striking. Kicks, great. Decent power, you know, he can hurt you. Volume's not there. He just doesn't have enough volume. So the more volume is going to be on the side of Jumagulov. The power is going to be on the side of Buniz. Now, it's not like one shot, just KO you flat, but he can hurt you. So when he gets to the mat, dude's got no takedown defense, first off. Well, not none, but not very good at all. But once he gets there, he's content to stay there. And I hate that in fighters. But what I do like is the submission threat because off his back, he's very dangerous. Now, I'm having a hard time here because on one hand, I think there's a lot going for Zhumagulov here. On the other hand, you'd be silly to pick this guy in a fight that you think there's a chance it goes to decision because this guy can't buy a decision. Like this guy couldn't even pay off a judge if he wanted to. I'm going to go with Bunis here. We've seen a lot of, you know, a lot of guys coming in, uh, debut fights and, you know, making big waves. Not a lot of confidence here. I'm going to sit this one out. I'm probably just going to kick my feet up on the coffee table, crack open a nice ice cold root beer, and just enjoy this fight. Because I think it's going to be a fun fight for as long as it lasts, whether that's the whole time or not very much time at all. And I'm going to take Bunis for the sake of making a pick. But like I said, don't put your money on this one. It's a trap. I know Zhao Gas is everybody's favorite these days, but Bunis is probably getting it done. I'll see you guys in the next fight. Let me My know who you have. I have a treat for you. This is going to be an interesting matchup here. Real quick, Denise Bondar, 4-1 in his last five. He's taking on Carlos Hernandez, who is also 4-1 in his last five. Here's the treat. Like, five, ten minutes before recording this. I've got the under two and a half rounds at plus 160 in this matchup. Now, why do I say that's important? These Bondars kill or be killed. This fight is ending in under two and a half rounds. I cannot see it going any longer than that, short of a miracle. Either Denise Bondar is going to go in there and ragdoll Hernandez, or Hernandez is going to put a striking clinic on Bondar, and Bondar is going to get e be eaten alive in the striking and go out. The one thing that we need to keep into keep in mind is that Bondar has not been been fighting in quite a while. He hurt his arm. Uh, 
his last fight was a loss due to an arm injury. Uh, he, yeah, had to have surgery on the dang thing. I think it was his elbow. Um, so he's been out for like over a year. That does make me worry that maybe he'll be a little bit more gun shy going in, but I don't think so. Denise Bondar just comes forward like a wrecking ball and he's going to try to, he's going to try to end the fight right away. Whether he wins or loses, he's going to try to make it happen quick. So that's how that style is. Now he's very kill or be killed. He's going to come across the cage. He's going to try and pick his guy, his opponent up, slam him to the mat with a takedown, very powerful takedown at that. He's a good scrambler though. So if his opponent starts doing some stuff, he can, you know, work him back to his feet or whatever. He scramble, take position snatch up the back a lot of the times and get a submission. A lot of times it's a rear naked, th uh, rear naked choke, but the submission threat is is live from a lot of different options. He, I believe of his 16 wins, I think 11 of them are submissions. So there it is. In the clinch though, he's got a lot of trips as well. So if he doesn't get down deep on a takedown and slam you down that way, if you kind of stuff it, you know, you give him the little cross face to the clinch, which is my favorite takedown defense. If you didn't know, now you do. The cross face to the clinch. Well, guess what? He's good at working in that clinch and getting the trips there so he can put you back on the mat from that. However, he's going to be outmatched in the striking by Carlos Hernandez, at least by my estimations. Now, but real quick about Bondar, he does have two professional boxing uh, matches, I do believe, but I'm pretty sure he lost both of them. So, you know, just because you've had the boxing match doesn't make you a boxer. Does it make sense? I mean, kind of, I guess. It technically makes him a boxer, but you know what I mean? You get what I'm saying. Hernandez is probably going to be a better striker. He's got good volume, works his combinations, and I do like his kicks a lot. I don't think kicks are the best thing to do against a wrestler that's trying to take you down, but maybe they are. Could be a good idea, especially if it works them the, you know, properly. But the uh, but chance of getting a kick caught is a bit risky for him because he doesn't have the best takedown defense. Now, offensively, he can mix in his own takedowns, and it'd be interesting to see how he does trying to take down Bondar. Uh, but realistically, I think Bondar gets this one done. I think he's probably going to get the win probably in the first round. However... I like the line on the under two and a half a whole lot better than I like the line on Bondar because that gives me the option that if Bondar isn't the same Bondar that he was, I said Bondar way too many times. If he's not the same Bondar that he was in, in his last matchup at post injury now, we have the 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 back backup option of Carlos Hernandez getting the finish in under two and a half rounds, which I think is a good safety net there. So for me, the under two and a half is the play. Bondar is the pick because that's what I do. I make picks on this channel. Let me know what you guys have, and I'll see you in the next Men's bantamweight division. We have Kung Ho Kang taking on Christian Canones. Canones is 5-0 in his last five, 4-1 four for Kang. This matchup is an interesting one. I do kind of, I do think this is going to be a tough fight to predict. I think a lot of people are going to be kind of throwing their hands up and being like, well, I guess this guy, or uh, I guess that guy. This is a really hard one because for Canones, he's a, a forward pressure style guy. He's got good striking, got KO power for sure. But he loves to get in a brawl, and that kind of adds an element of chaos into the fight, right? And that sometimes works out really well for him, but it can also work out really bad for a fighter because, you know, getting in a brawl, you can only do that so many times before you get caught. So uh, he does have good wrestling, though. I do like his takedowns excellent. The takedown defense isn't as good, but the offensive takedowns are there. He's got good jujitsu as well, but he's very much submission over position. He's going to try and get, get you out of there as opposed to just racking up control time, all that good stuff. Now, for the Kang side... He's good at range, good striking at range. As If you pressure him really hard, he doesn't like that as well. Um, but he's got a good solid 1-2, like a rangy 1-2, and he's got good volume while he's doing it. He's also a bit more of a wrestler when he uh, when he gets those takedowns going. He's going to be more pressure and control over submission, but he does have some creative submissions as well. But he's going to try to – he's going to secure the position before he starts going for submissions, whereas Quinones is going to just start diving on submissions. Uh, control comes secondary kind of thing. So for me, I think this is a really interesting matchup, and I think it's going to be a tough one to predict. Uh, but to make the pick, I'm going to take Quinones. I can, I think I can rely on his forward pressure style and just aggressiveness to kind of make a guy like Kang uncomfortable on the feet. And then when it comes to the grappling exchanges, I think he's dangerous enough that regardless of who gets the takedown, it's going to be a fight for position. It's going to be a fight for the submissions. It's going to be... It's going to be an aggressive back and forth. There's not going to be... And what I, I, you're, I know you're probably thinking, oh, well, duh, of course it's a fight for the... What I mean is it's not going to be one guy just laying on the other one and racking up minutes. I think it's going to be an active grappling exchange, either ending back up on the feet or somebody taking control and getting the sub. So I think Canones gets the win here. Um, couldn't... Uh, I don't know if I, how I feel about the over-under in this one. So I, this fight is an entire pass for me. Let's put it that way. But Quinones is the pick. Let me know who you have, and I will see you in the matchup on this one here. We've got Jimmy Flick taking on Alessandro Costa. Both guys are 4-1 and one in their last five, but there's a little caveat there. Jimmy Flick is coming off of one fight back after a retirement, I guess, uh, where he 
you know, so he's basically one fight back in the UFC after quite some time off. Um, so the one that lost is his most recent fight where he was knocked out by Charles Johnson. Now, uh, the Costa loss in his last five is against Amir Albazi, who... Well, we're not gonna we're not gonna touch what he just did. So anyway, back to this one here. We don't, don't want to stir up any controversies. Uh, the oh, uh, the uh, height and reach advantage here is going to be for Jimmy Flick. He is five foot seven with a seventy and a half inch reach, five foot four with a sixty seven inch reach on the Costa side. So much shorter, much smaller reach. Uh, the 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 size advantage is there for Flick. And a lot of times he's going to use that length in the grappling because striking isn't really his thing. However, at range he does have decent striking with the uh with the kicks not so much anything else but his kicks are pretty good at range uh but anything else and he's, he's realistically just looking to grapple he's got you know he can get the takedown when he needs to um good enough there but he'll jump on a submission while you're standing he does not care he's very strong in the jiu-jitsu department with a large toolbox and he is fast on those submissions the thing is his chin hasn't looked good he's been knocked out in five of his six losses so take that into account in his last matchup he was knocked out by charles johnson who hasn't seemed to knock a whole lot of guys out. So let's put it that way. His chin's not looking the best. Now for Costa, Costa's got good striking. He's got very good power and he can work the body very well. The problem is sometimes he's a little bit low volume, which I don't want to see, especially against a guy like Flick, who if you're going to give him space to do what he needs to do and not put pressure on him, he can start working that, that jiu-jitsu that he's very good at. Now, the takedown defense is there for Costa. He's very good with it. And he does have solid jiu-jitsu if it does get to the mat. A lot of times he'll use it to get back up. But he can work things off his back. He can work for a sweep, things like that. I just don't think that's going to be very useful against a guy like Jimmy Flick, who pretty much is a jiu-jitsu guy, all right? Uh, this matchup here, I do like Costa in the matchup, but something I like even more than that is the under. The uh, one and a half, two and a half, doesn't matter. Fight doesn't go the distance. They all should be safe. This fight's probably ending really early, either first round or like just into the second. Either Costa's going to probably knock out Jimmy Flick or Jimmy Flick's going to submit Costa with one of his crazy submissions. That's probably where it goes. There's a potential submission on the Costa side, like to submit Flick, but probably not. Uh, realistically, Jimmy Flick's probably the submission upside, Costa's the knockout upside. I think it ends probably in the first round. The under one and a half should be safe. I just thought of this. The odds, what are the odds if you play Jimmy Flick by submission and you play Costa, Alessandro Costa, by knockout or TKO? How big of a plus number do you get on those? Probably not good enough to play a both. Yeah, just play the under. Unless you, unless you can get good plus money on both of those. I haven't looked at it yet. That just came to me while recording this. So I'm, I'm thinking about it. You know, playing both sides isn't a bad thing. Sure, when you put out the percentage of your bets or whatever, you're going you're gonna to be 50% on those two bets. But if you're winning money, who cares? We want money. Money goes in our bank account. We don't have percentage of bets in our bank account. So anyway, play the under, though, unless the, unless the odds on that are really good. Let me know what you guys think. I'll see you in the next Phantom weight bout here. We have Miles Johns taking on Hione Barcelos. Marcellus is two and three in his last five. He's fought some pretty tough competition as of late. Johns is three and two in his last five. Now, here's the thing. Marcellus is 36 years old, 29 for Johns. So the age is starting to get there for Marcellus. He only has four losses on his career, but three of those came in his last five fights. So that's something to consider. Now, for, uh, for Miles Johns, well, for both of these guys, honestly, both of these guys are good wrestlers that have seemed to be more in the striking as of late. For Miles Johns, he's pretty much come into boxing. That's what he's doing. He's boxing. He's got a lot of power. He's looking for a counter shot, uh, but the volume's just not there. He's just waiting for that big, heavy, like, you know, overhand or a big, heavy hook or whatever. He's just waiting to knock somebody out with a power shot. Now, Barcelos, on the other hand, is coming back off of a knockout. Yeah, he hasn't been knocked out a ton, but, you know, coming back off of a knockout, does he want to experience that again? Probably not. So, he might be a little bit slower to uh, to engage with a guy like Johns who's waiting on that power shot. Now, if Johns decides to use it, he does have good wrestling. He has good takedowns, and he can get on top of guys and control them very well, win minutes that way. Uh, the takedown defense is there for him, but he's going to slow down as the fight goes on. Now, for Barcelos, he's pretty darn good everywhere. He's a strong wrestler with good takedown entries, and he can scramble with the best of them. His jiu-jitsu is, is very, very high level. He has one of the bigger toolboxes in the entire bantamweight division as far as jiu-jitsu is concerned. He's got solid Muay Thai as well. He's worked combinations, good volume, and he has an awesome leg kick. Here's the only problem for Barshows. Barshows is better than Johns in every aspect of MMA, except for the fact that he's 36 years old. Miles Johns hits like a freight train. So, Barshows is definitely going to be the pick, but I have not bet him because... Well, first off, I don't want him to get knocked out, and that would suck uh, because, you know, we, don't, we, we all want Barcelos to win, right? Unless you 
big fan of Miles Johns. But coming off of that big knockout loss, how is he going to react to that? How is, he, is, he gonna, is it going to slow him up? He's going to make him a little gun shy. And he is getting older. Now, do I think he's chinning? Not necessarily. Uh, we, anybody can get knocked out. But I think Barcello should win this fight. I think out of if they ran this fight 100 times, I think Barcelos probably wins about like 73 of them. Like just a number I made up just now. But there's a decent clip of those where Miles Jones gets that knockout. And that's the thing you got to worry about. Barcelos is a pick though. Let me know what you guys think. Do you think I'm silly for not betting him because he probably is going to win? I don't know. I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments. Let me know and I'll see you in the next weight matchup here between a couple of older guys. Uh, Nicholas Dalby is taking on Muslim Salikov. Now for Salikov, he's 4-1 in his last five. Uh, that one loss being to Li Jing Liang. No shame there. The guy's pretty good. Uh, Nicholas Dalby is 3-1 in a no contest in his last five. Pretty good record for both of these guys. 19-3 on the career for Salikov. 21-4-1 for Dalby. So both guys have a ton of wins. Not that many losses. The height and reach. The height is the same. The reach, 4.5 inch advantage for Dalby. Here's the thing. Now, I, I realize you're looking at this right now and you're saying, like, why didn't he write anything for Dalby? I was sitting there. Taking more notes today, I try and because I'd left this fight to last. Well, not really. I'd finished the Muslim Salikov notes, but I couldn't write anything down from Dalby. I'm watching all his fights, and I'm sitting there like, what is Dalby good at? Like, he's not bad at anything, but he's not good anywhere either. He's just steady. He's just a steady fighter. He's decent everywhere. He's the jack of all trades. I even threw this out in like a Twitter gr uh, group message thing that I'm in. That I kind of just mostly lurk, but I actually commented or said something one time, finally. And I said, hey guys, I'm sitting here watching Nicholas Dalby footage. And I can't, for the life of me, think of anything that he's good at. And they had the same problem. They were like, yeah, he's just kind of jack of all trades. He's just decent everywhere. And that's what he does to beat guys. He's got decent, he's just going to come forward with his forward pressure. He's got decent volume on the feet, whether that's, any, you know, he's got decent volume on the takedowns, whether he's just going for strikes, mixing things in, whatever he's doing, he's just decent at it. He's trying to win minutes by just outworking guys. Um, everybody comments on that weird breathing thing he does. Yeah, it's kind of weird, but whatever. Um, yeah, Nicholas Dalby. He's just decent everywhere. Pretty good at winning minutes, you know. Hard guy to get out of there. Obviously, he's only lost four times in his entire career. So the dude's pretty good, right? Jack of all trades. It's paid off for him. On the other side, we have very much a specialist for Muslim Salkov. Now, he does have decent wrestling. He can mix in his own takedowns. He's got good takedown defense and works right back to his feet when he does get taken down. But he's a high-level striker. He's very accurate, very powerful, and his kicks to the body are absolutely merciless but sometimes he just doesn't do a lot. Sometimes the volume is extremely lacking and he's content just to kind of stay out there and like look for his shots and not do a ton uh, throughout the fight, throughout the minutes. He's looking to win the fight with, with not putting a ton of volume out there. He's looking to win the fight with as few strikes as he can, at least is what it seems like. I think it's an interesting fight and a very tough one to pick because like I said, both guys are towards the end of their career, both like 38, 39. These guys are both getting up there. Dalby's not really bad anywhere, uh, but Muslim Salgov's really good in one area, but then sometimes he just doesn't do it enough. So, hard one to pick. Uh, this is a fight I've stayed away from entirely so far, uh, but Muslim Salikov's go going to be the pick because he does probably have more finishing upside than Dalby, I do believe. Uh, I think the body shots, if he can start working those kicks in there, I think he, he is a very deadly striker if he does decide to start working the hands, working the feet, getting, getting those combinations going. But, you know, we might also just see Dalby win in minutes because Salikov's not doing enough and Dalby's just doing a lot of whatever he's good at, right? I don't know. Salikov's a pick. No confidence. Let me know what you guys have. I'd love to hear from you. Let it, put it down in the comments. I'll see you guys right, with the men's lightweight division. Manuel Torres taking on Nicolas Mata. Both guys 4-1 in their last five. Both guys are very much kill or be killed. So yet again, we have another under that I really like in this matchup here. There's a lot of over-unders. Uh, keep your eyes peeled over on patreon.com slash 138MMA because I might put together a little round robin between all the different over and unders I like with a couple of fighters that I like and just make it a big old round robin parlay. I might throw that out there. I haven't, commit I haven't committed to it yet. But keep your eyes peeled over there on patreon.com slash 138MMA. And also, hey, for all you guys that have already liked this video without me reminding you, I appreciate the heck out of you guys. Thank you so much. If you've already done so, give yourself a little round of applause because you guys are the real ones out there doing the darn thing. We appreciate you here at 138 MMA. That's me. I appreciate you. Uh, 
it's it's fantastic all the support that you guys have been giving me comment down below tell me what you guys are picking tell me what you guys like in the matchups but also liking the videos that's one of the most important things you can do for the channel and it is free free it doesn't cost you a penny just hit the like button it's going to shove you the youtube into the youtube algorithm it's going to shove me in there and what happens is I'm going to start showing up for other people, and they're going to say, gosh, I sure like this 138 MMA guy. He's got a cool little marker board and stuff. I should go ahead and look at his videos and stuff, and I should go like his videos so more friends can see it. It's great. I appreciate it. But if you haven't done so already, that's okay. I understand sometimes you get caught up in watching the content and you forget to like the video. That's fine. I understand. You can go do that right now. So do me a solid. Like the video. Then we'll break down this fight some more, okay? So... Like I said, I love the under. Both guys are very much kill or be killed. For Torres, he's a fast starter. He's gonna. I, I, how many of his fights have ended in the first round? Most of them, right? Like, most of them. The dude just comes across, gets it going. He's got good striking, tons of power, tons of volume. He is a bit sloppy, but he makes up for it with volume and power. Uh, and the defense, yeah, who needs defense, right? Like, to heck with it. Uh, he has a, he, the, the best thing about him, though, is his clinch. He does have a very good clinch, and those knees are absolutely dangerous absolutely deadly he will put you out with a knee for sure if it does get to the mat he's got decent Brazilian jiu-jitsu a lot of times he's going to start working for stuff and trying to use that to get back up or just you know lock something up if he can but he's working to get back up a lot of the time the one red flag is he, it has been quite a while I believe it's been about a year or so since we've seen Manuel Torres it's been a while so on the modest side dude's also kill or be killed he's a good striker looking for a lot of counters but he likes to throw a big bomb he's gonna swing heavy and kind of sometimes overcommit, but when he lands, that shot's going to put guys down. He hits very, very hard. But again, his striking defense also isn't very good. So something I want to point out is that if you got two guys with bad striking defense and two guys with a lot of power, stands to reason that an under would be a good play, right? So there we go. That backs up my under play. Uh, he does have good takedown defense, though, so I don't really see this fight being a, being a grappling match. I think it's going to be a striking matchup. Somebody's probably getting knocked out. Maybe there's a good play on either guy to win by knockout, maybe. I don't know if that. I don't know what the odds are on that. But otherwise, the under two and a half is probably a good spot. Let me know what you guys think. I'm taking Manuel Torres in the matchup. I think he's the more dangerous guy, but realistically, I'm just going to bet the under. That's the way to go. My pick percentage could look terrible this week, or it could look great. But I bet you. I'm going to bet you, because that's what I do. I bet on stuff. I'm going to bet you guys that my my over under picks are going to be the are going to be better than my picking picks. Now I, there's nothing I'm wagering on this. I'm just throwing it out there. The over under picks are going to be hitting this week. Let me know what you guys think. Do you like the under here and I'll see you in the match up here between Pat Sabatini and Lucas Almeida. Both guys 4 and 1 in their last 5. Almeida's going to be a bit bigger at 5'11 with a 71 inch reach as opposed to the 5'8 70 inch reach of Pat Sabatini. This is definitely going to be a tale of uh the striker versus the grappler now don't get me wrong almeida can grapple and pat sabatini can kind of strike uh the thing is one guy is going to be way better in the grappling one guy's gonna be way better in the striking now let's start with almeida he's got himself a nice tidy little 14 and one record his only loss coming to daniel zell huber over on the contender series but he's made his way into the ufc and here he is now fighting pat sabatini solid striker with a ton of power and he's quick on those strikes he doesn't really have the best takedown defense because what he tries to do to counter a takedown is counter it with a strike. Now, any of you that have ever tried to stop a takedown in your life know that you can't try to strike to stop a takedown and successfully stop the takedown unless you, you know, knock the opponent out or whatever. And that's what he's trying to do because he knows he has pretty good Brazilian jiu-jitsu to usually be able to either survive or work something for, uh, for himself like a submission. He has a couple of submission wins on his record as well, but... The takedown defense is he's trying to knock your head off. So if he does that, great. But if he doesn't, he's going to have to rely on that jiu-jitsu. Now, normally that's okay, but he's fighting a guy in Pat Sabatini who is a relentless wrestler who is going to be able to get control. He's going to chain wrestle those takedowns. So if you don't get that knockout, you're in trouble. And if you start fighting back to your feet, he's got very good mat returns. Also, once he gets you to the mat, he is a back taker. When he takes your back, well, guess what happens? He starts looking for that rear naked choke. And seven of his 17 wins come via rear naked choke. He has was it like 10 or 11 submissions, something like that, maybe more. But the but seven of those wins are rear naked choke because that is what he practices the most. And if he's on your back, that's what he's going for. Uh, the other thing is his boxing, it's all right, I guess. It's decent. But don't be, if you're Pat Sabatini, don't be trying to strike with a guy like Lucas Almeida, especially after you got chin checked bad in your last fight by Damon Jackson. His chin has been, been tested quite a few times, and it seems to be just kind of starting to get a little bit worse. 
probably because he gets it tested so many darn times. Maybe he's fine. He's taking a little bit of time off. Could be back at it. No big deal. But that's, that is a concern. This matchup is the one that I'm least confident in picking. So for me, what I'm going to do, when this fight comes around, I'm going to crack open another nice ice cold root beer. I'm going to kick my feet up on the coffee table. And I'm going to kick back and enjoy the fight while I'm sipping down some root beer. I'm going to have to make a pick. And I think that Sabatini probably gets it done more often than not. I think he's fought the better level of competition, which I don't usually use as a deciding factor. That's how close this is. Level of competition, you use it to some extent, but it's not usually my deciding factor, if that's if, if you know what I mean. I think he's about the better level of competition, and I think that he's going to be able to implement his game plan to Almeida. But yeah, Almeida knockout is definitely a possibility. So I'm just going to pass on this one entirely. But let me know what you guys think. I know a lot of people are out there tweeting about Lucas Almeida inside the distance lines or knockout lines. Definitely a real possibility. I'm just going to sit back and watch it. Let me know what you guys think, and I'll see you in the next matchup here between Armin Petrosian and Christian Leroy Duncan. Duncan is undefeated. He is 5-0 in his last five because, you know, 8 and overall. Petrosian, 3-2 and two in the last five. He's fought a pretty good level of competition thus far in the UFC. Guys, I'm getting a little bit sleepy, so hopefully I can keep the energy up for this one. We're going to see how it goes. Petrosian, very high-level striker. He's got accurate kicks, which is my probably my favorite thing about him. He does control the range very well, and he can work his combinations. But I don't like the low hands because that's how you get caught. He's durable, though, so it does. if he does get caught, it's not that big of a deal for him. I mean, it's not fun, obviously, but he's been able to weather storm so far. Um, takedown defense, a little suspect, but he's been able to work back up to his feet anytime he's been taken down, so not a big deal. Now, for Christian Leroy Duncan. This guy is a bit flashy, and I don't so much like that. On the feet, he's a little bit flashy. I don't really like that part of his game, but everything else I do like. He's a good striker with flying knees, big elbow shots, and a ton of power. He's putting guys out of there when he hits them, okay? But the problem is that flashiness can come back to bite him in a guy, against a guy like Petrosian. So for, for Christian Leroy Duncan, he needs to be able to use his wrestling. He has decent wrestling. He needs to be able to mix that in to keep Petrosian thinking about whether the takedown's coming or it's a flying knee or whatever it may be. Because for Duncan, if he starts to get predictable and starts doing all this flashy stuff that he has done on the regional scene, obviously his first UFC fight didn't last that long. So got us the win there, though. I told you to pick him first round, didn't I? Didn't I? If you remember, I told you. Uh, so either way, um, Christian Leroy Duncan... I do like a lot of things about this guy, but that is going to be scary against a guy like Petrosian. I haven't bet this fight. I'm, I'm sitting this one out. Uh, but I do. I am going to pick Christian Leroy Duncan to get it done. I just think he's a more explosive guy. And I think at some point he's going to be able to crack Petrosian and land a big shot. Might get the win that way. Or I think he's going to be able to mix in the wrestling just enough to hold Petrosian up against the cage. Land an elbow strike. Keep him up against the cage. Do what he's got to do to just get, get the decision there. I'm not confident in it at all. Petrosian could get this win, no problem. The guy is the better pure striker. It's just this is an MMA fight, and pure strikers don't often do fantastic in MMA. Sometimes, but not often. So for me, Christian Leroy Duncan is the pick, but zero confidence. Let me know what you guys think, and I'll see you in the next one. event, so do me a solid. If you haven't done it already after my little soapbox earlier, like this video. I appreciate it greatly. Uh, in this one here, we have Armin Sarukian taking on Joakim Silva. I believe that's how you pronounce it. I know it looks like Joaquin, but I've heard the commentators call it Joaquim. I don't know. If you're from Brazil and you know how that's supposed to be pronounced, let me know in the comments if I'm saying that right. Joaquim? Is that right? Either way, he's 2-3 and three in his last, last five fights. 4-1 four and one for Sarukian, but that's a bunch of crap is what that is. Sarukian beat Gamrod. I don't care what anybody says. That was a horrible decision. Sarukian won that fight. He's nine, He's 20 and two by my estimations, but whatever. Judges are horrible. Just got to be what it is. So for four and one for the for the official record's sake, but he's really five and zero oh in his last five. Now for Silva, the two and three doesn't look very good. But hey, you know what? Biggest stones of the week is to Silva for stepping in on this matchup, giving Sarukian an opponent after. Um, I just blanked on his name. My goodness, Hanato Moicano. Wow, that was tough. After Hanato Moicano had to pull out, Joakim Silva steps in. Can you tell I'm tired? It's been a long day, guys. I'm hanging in there, though, for you. I'm hanging in there for you. Now, for Silva, he's a good striker with a ton of power. And if you look at the dude, he's just bodied up, chiseled, shredded. Well, guess what? That just shows through in his power. So that's a good thing. He does have the power. He's got good jujitsu, and he is a submission threat. So don't get me wrong. He does have a path to victory. But he's fighting one of the best in the entire division, and that's Armin Sarukian, who is a very strong wrestler with 
absolutely devastating ground and pound. His takedowns are very good. The only person that's been able to get up easily against him was Gamrot. And it wasn't really easily, but Gamrot just, just keeps scrambling to get back up. But Sarukian was still able to land the takedowns. And I think he won the striking battle against Gamrot because I'm not letting that one go. I think he won that fight and I got robbed on my bet. So that's what happened. But the takedown defense is there as well. So I, I mean, I don't think that's going to be an issue for him. He is a good striker, but it's a bit unorthodox. And I think that's kind of what cost him that match maybe was the fact that his striking is a bit unorthodox and the judges didn't know what they're looking at because they don't know how to watch fights because they're horrible. Uh, but Armin Sarukian should win this fight. But he's like a minus 1,000, minus 1,100, something like that. So what are you going to do with that, huh? Uh, I'm not going to play the over-under. I don't, I don't think Silva is just a walk in the park. Uh, so even though he is not on the level of Sarukian by what I can see, I don't think he's a walk in the park. I don't think he's a scrub. I don't think he's a bum. And so the over-under to me, I'm not sure because he is a durable, tough guy. So I could see Sarukian saying, okay, well, let's, let's give this guy some respect he deserves because he hits like a truck. So it won't. it's not like he's just going to run right through him. Or maybe he does. Maybe he says, you know what? I'm going to run right through and make a good, a good, impressive showing and get to the title shot. But here's the thing. Here's what I'm thinking, guys. And I've heard a lot of people. I've heard a lot of people say that Charles Oliveira should be next for the title shot, okay, against Islam Makhachev. But let me put this. Let me let me throw this at you. Islam walked right through Charles, and you know what? I called that. If you watched my video, I told you before that first fight. If you watched my video, I told you that's the that was my biggest bet I've ever made in my life was on Islam Makhachev in that matchup. He was a minus one ninety favorite, and I hammered it. Uh, that it was great. Not trying to rub it in your face. I'm just saying that it went like I thought it would. Now here's the thing. Armin Sarukian had a pretty darn good matchup with Islam. Now, I'm not saying that if Sarukian wins this matchup, he should get a fight with Makachev because it is still a rematch, whatever. And he did technically lose to Gamrot not that long ago. Now, for Sarukian, what I think after he wins this fight against Silva, I think you match up Sarukian with Charles Oliveira while the winner of the uh, Gaethje and Poirier fight fights Makachev, not because I think that that's really like, you know, like the, the, the best rightful opponent for Makachev, but I think the best thing to do is get one more matchup for Oliveira before he goes back to fight Makachev, and I think Sarukian is a good test for him in that matchup. So I'm, I'm going on a soapbox here, so bear with me. If you're still hanging in there, I appreciate you guys. Thank you. But I think that Sarukian versus Oliveira will, sh will be good enough to show with A, whether Sarukian is the guy that needs to be fighting against Makachev for the title fight. Or B, Oliveira has improved enough that if he can get put out Sarukian, who is a very strong wrestler, similar in that aspect to Makachev, if he can get get a guy like Sarukian out of there, Oliveira cements that he is the number one contender and that was just a bad night for him and he does deserve that title shot. Now, for me, I think that's the matchup to make. Nobody else is talking about it. I'm the one saying it. So if you guys agree with me, let me know in the comments because I'd love to hear from you. If you think I'm wrong, that's okay. It, it's fine, but that's what I think should be. I don't think I don't think Charles needs to be rushed to the title fight. I don't think Sarukian deserves a title fight right now either. I think it, he needs a couple more. But that Oliveira matchup is the one that makes sense to me. I know a lot of people have said Darius should fight Sarukian. It's just not good booking. You you guys coming off wins fight should fight guys coming off wins. Guys fighting loss coming off losses should fight guys coming off of losses because then you have somebody who's coming off of a loss that's going to get back in the winning department. So then that person that's coming off a loss can then fight somebody else with a loss when the two winners fight. That's just how it works. You don't want to have a ton of guys with losses on the record or just keep getting strings of losses three, four, five in a row. I'm just trying to teach you how this guy, this works, okay? Sorry, I don't mean to go on the soapbox. If you haven't skipped ahead yet, thank you guys. We'll see you guys. I'll see you guys in the main event. Let me know what you think of all that stuff I just said, and I'll see you there. We've got a middleweight matchup between Marvin Vittori and Jared Cannonier, and this is your main event of the evening, so you know what that means. This is your last reminder to like this video. I want to see a spinning roundhouse kick right to that button. Don't break your keyboard. Make sure you keep it all intact so you can watch the rest of this video, and if you made it through my soapbox in the co-main event, don't worry. I've got a a little one in this one not as long but a little one and i think you're gonna like it so we have jared cannon and marvin vittori both guys three and two in their last five fights vittori is quite a bit younger at 29 years old as opposed to the 39 years old of cannon that is the 10 year age gap deal statistics and crap uh either way jared cannon dude's a good striker with a ton of power 
He's very defensively sound. He keeps his hands up, blocks a lot of shots. He's patient looking for his openings, but he does have a very good leg kick. And I do think that is his best path to victory in this matchup is working that leg kick often and working it early in the matchup. If he's going to win, he needs to get that going because guess what? If he doesn't do that, he's got a guy in Vittoria that's just going to keep coming forward like a gosh darn zombie and make him work that whole fight. And he's going to be on the back foot. So he needs to get that leg kick going. He doesn't have the best takedown defense, but if he is on the mat, his submission defense is usually pretty darn good. We don't have to worry too much about that. Now, for Vittori, the dude's got decent striking, nothing to write home about, but he's just got plenty of volume, and he's just going to zombie forward. Like I said, he's going to keep coming forward, using that volume, and he's going to mix in the wrestling. He's going to The cage push is where it's going to be at in this fight, I do believe. He's going to get Cannonier up against the cage and hold him there a lot. So can Cannonier get off the cage? Yeah, maybe, but it's going to be tough, and I don't think he's going to be able to do it easily. Vittori can mix in the takedowns, whether it be at the cage or in the open mat, but he is probably going to be better against the cage, especially against a guy like Cannonier, who is very strong. He can use that cage to then start working his takedowns from there. Now, he's a grinder with a ton of top control. So if he gets on top of you or gets you up against the cage, he's just going to grind you out, land some shots, nothing too crazy. Like I said, he doesn't have a ton of power, but he can work you over. And he's got a chin. So if he's got to walk through anything, it's not a problem. Vittori, he's got a head like cement. But the cardio, the cardio is important. He's going to have better cardio. He's going to be more durable. And he's just going to keep coming forward. Guys, I said I had a couple of hot takes on this card. This is one of them. A lot of people are betting Jared Cannonier, and I do not understand it for the life of me. Marvin Vittori is going to win this fight. I just can't see Cannonier winning this fight unless he's landing that leg kick from the moment the bell sounds. If he's landing a just a gosh darn load of leg kicks to the point that Vittori can't even stand on his leg anymore. That's the only way he's going to be able to get Vittori out of here. He's not knocking him out. He's not going to out-wrestle him. What's he going to do, out-volume him? No chance. This fight is all Vittori. Vittori's winning this fight. I, unless all of a sudden his chin cracks. We've seen it before. Dover's chin cracked in his last fight. It, I guess it happens. But I don't see it happening here. Vittori's going to win this fight. I love it at the odds it's at now, but I'm going to love it even more once it becomes an underdog because a lot of people keep betting Jared Cannonier. I am all over the Vittori line. I, I, I've already bet him, and as soon as that switches that he's the underdog because apparently it looks like it's going to, I'm going to bet him some more. I think people are crazy for betting on Jared Cannonier. I don't see him winning this fight. Now, if Jared Cannonier wins this fight, come back to this video and tell me I'm a complete idiot. At least the comments, the, all the comments on the video of you guys telling me that I'm a total clown is going to at least boost me in the algorithm. Because I will look like a total clown. I'm all over Marvin Vittori here. I think he gets this one done. No problem. That sounded weird. I'm not all over Marvin Vittori here. I'm all over the betting line for Marvin Vittori here. I think he gets this one done. And I do like the odds. I also like the over. I don't think he's going to finish Jared Cannonier. So if you want to play Marvin Vittori by decision, that's not a big deal. I think that's a good, a, a nice safe play. And I think you can get him at plus money. If you really want the safe bet, you could probably play both guys at plus money if you do it right. Because Cannonier, I believe, is still plus money. And Vittori is going to be plus money in a day or so because for whatever reason, the line is moving towards Canada. Let me know what you guys think. Which side are you on? This main event is interesting because a lot of people seem to be on the Canadier side and I can't understand it. So let me know. I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching. And don't forget on your way out, like the video and subscribe if you're interested in seeing more stuff from 138 MMA. See you soon.